Hello class, this is Miss Augustine, and today we're going to talk about kinetics. And reaction kinetics is chapter 17 in our textbook. So we begin talking about kinetics by talking about collision theory. And I'm not talking about car collisions, although this is a scary collision. What I'm talking about is the reaction process. So um, in order for a reaction to take place. There's typically a step-by-step -step sequence of reactions uh, where the overall chemical change takes place. And why does the rate of a chemical reaction vary so widely? It has to do with collision theory. And that is that in order for a chemical reaction to take place, the reactant molecules have to collide with one another. And in order to produce a product, the reactant molecules have to have the right orientation and the correct energy. And so the energy portion of that has to do with activation energy, which we've talked about before. Um, the reactants have to have enough energy to go from being reactants to products, but there's also an orientation portion of it where depending on what the reactive part of a particular molecule is, that has to collide with the right part of the other reactant molecule. And again, only a fraction of the collisions will meet those requirements. So when we talk about collision theory, we often talk about an example like smog plus ozone, which will produce nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. So here is the reaction sequence. Nitrogen um, monoxide gas is often a component of smog. Here is our ozone, which is uh, triplet oxygen, and it will form nitrogen dioxide and oxygen gas. So here's your nitrogen monoxide, here's your ozone, and this actually kind of uh, resonates back and forth, that double bond, and then there's your nitrogen dioxide and your oxygen. So in order for this to take place, here is your nitrogen monoxide and ozone. And again, they're going to be colliding and they have to have the right energy and orientation in order to get out here and uh, form product. And in this case, scenario B, you'll see they react, they come together, and then they go back out again and they reform the starting materials, which is the reactants. You reform the nitrogen monoxide and the ozone. So some of the reactants are going to form products and some are just going to collide and go right back out to be reactants again. So we think about this energy barrier that reactants have to overcome in order to turn into products. And that is the so-called activation energy. And that is that minimum amount of energy that reactants must have before they can be converted to products. So if we think about our energy diagrams and we think about this is the energy, the y-axis, and then the reaction coordinate, which can be thought of as time um, along the x-axis. So you have your reactants here, and then they have to climb this energy hill to get to this so-called activated complex, and if it has the right energy and orientation, it can become products. And so this uh, line right here, the E sub A, is the activation energy. And that's the difference in energy between the reactants and the activated complex. So this activated complex is this unstable high energy species that has to be formed in order for reactants to convert to products. And it's kind of an in-between stage. It's designated using a superscript double dagger, which is this funny little thing. And again, here is an example of the ozone nitrogen monoxide um, activated complex or reaction intermediate. And again, it's got this funny little uh, superscript double dagger. So the energy diagram for the reaction of nitrogen monoxide with ozone might look something like this. So here are our reactants, nitrogen monoxide and ozone. And then if they can collide and I have this activated complex or um, reaction intermediate here where you have the nitrogen monoxide and the ozone have come together. And then if they have that right orientation, they're going to fall down and form 
nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen gas. So again, here are the molecules. Here is this so-called transition state. Again, superscript double dagger, and then there are my products. So we can also talk about whether a reaction is endothermic or exothermic. This first example is exothermic, where the reactants are higher in energy than the products. You still have an activated complex, so you still have an energy of activation that must be overcome in order to form products. Here the amount of energy released is this blue line. This uh, shorter line is showing what the activation energy is. And then this little dotted line here is if a catalyst is employed, it lowers the activation energy, so it facilitates the reaction. And again, you form products. And then this is the endothermic example where there is a very high energy of activation. And again, um, the activation energy is this line. The difference between reactants and products would be this line. That would be the delta H for the reaction. And the dotted line is showing what a catalyzed reaction would look like. So um, another energy diagram example is uh, for the following reaction, which is exothermic. So the reaction of hydrogen iodide two molecules of hydrogen iodide decompose to form hydrogen gas and iodine. So can we draw an energy diagram that shows the relative energies of the reactants, products, and the so-called activated complex? And then we're going to label the diagram with the molecular representation of the reactants, products, and we're going to propose a structure for the activated complex. So here's our reaction. Here would be a, an example of an exothermic product, uh, potential energy diagram, where the reactants are lower in energy than the product. So that's how we know it's exothermic. So then over here, I would add in my reactants, so hydrogen iodide with hydrogen iodide. And then I'm going to put in what I would consider to be the activated complex. So two hydrogen iodide molecules encountering one another. There's my little superscript double dagger. And then this would be my products down here. And again, my hydrogen and my iodine. So then what makes reaction rates differ. So what makes milk and other foods spoil more quickly, for instance? What happens if you accidentally drop uh, some bleach into a dark, uh, dark laundry wash, so your jeans or whatever. If you only added a drop versus what if you added in a whole cup of bleach to your blue jeans that you were washing? What would dissolve faster, granulated sugar or a sugar cube? So all of these are things that we think about when we think about reaction rates. So chemical kinetics is the area of chemistry that is concerned with reaction rates and with the mechanisms that these take place in. And the reaction rate is the change in concentration of the reactants per unit time as a reaction is taking place. The unit used is molarity, so concentration, per time. So if you're talking about rate, it always has a time component. And the rate of reaction is dependent on really two things, the collision frequency of the reactants and the collision efficiency of the reactants. So not only do they have to collide, but they have to collide with the correct orientation and energy. So factors that include that influence reaction rates include the following, the temperature, the concentrations, the surface area, the presence of a catalyst. We need to look at each of these in terms of collision theory. So we'll take them one at a time. So first of all, temperature. The average uh, kinetic energy of a substance increases as the temperature rises. So an increase will uh, in temperature will increase the fraction of collisions that are effective. So when the temperature is increased, they're moving with higher kinetic energy, they're moving faster, and so they're going to collide more frequently and the collisions will also be more energetic. 
So that means that there will be more molecules that have the required activation energy. In general, for a typical reaction, the rate will double for every 10 degree C increase in temperature, and that's kind of a rule of thumb. Concentration. Reactions will go faster when the concentration of one or more of the reactants increases. Why? Well, when you increase the concentration, it increases the number of reactants per unit volume, which means that there will be more molecules, and they're going to be closer together, and so the number of collisions per unit time will increase. Surface area. Similar to an increase in concentration, the more surface area there is, that means the more molecules or atoms are exposed and the more reaction collisions will take place. So if you think of granulated sugar versus a sugar cube, if you're trying to, for instance, sweeten your iced tea, is it smarter to put in granulated sugar or a big lump of sugar? I'm going to say it's probably smarter to put in granulated. There's more surface area, more collisions. So let's look at the fraction of collisions versus collision energy at different temperatures. So here is a graph and it's showing on the y-axis the fraction of collisions and on the x-axis the energy. So you want to look at this and say what is the fraction of collisions with high enough energy to react and that's down here the uh, activation energy. So right here in this portion we have a high fraction of low energy collisions. So there's a lot at the lower temperature. There's significantly more um, collisions that have low energy. And then if we look at this other end, there's a low fraction of high energy collisions. And if you're comparing the two, if you're starting at a higher temperature here, the collision energy, there's a much greater portion that have the activation energy, the minimum energy required, compared to the blue line, which is at a lower temperature. So we're looking at collisions here. So again, you have to be thinking about the particles having enough energy to collide successfully. And so then we can talk about catalysts. Those are substances that alter the pathway in which a reaction occurs without being consumed in the reaction. So they lower the pathway by lowering the activation energy and that way the rate of the reaction can be increased and there's a great fraction of reactants that can achieve the new minimum energy. So again here is a picture of a catalyzed pathway. You'll notice that the activation energy is much lower than the uncatalyzed pathway. It's not necessarily a straightforward path. There might be some bumps and looks more like a mountain range, but again this is an example of how a catalyzed pathway has a lower activation energy. So that's all I wanted to talk about for now. This is Miss Augustine signing off, and I apologize for my dog Maggie, who is snoring under my desk.